To the NFL Max, the radio show inspired by the league founded in 1998, bringing you 20 plus years of fantasy football experience. Broadcasting from our brains to your earbuds each and every week as we break down player profiles for your teams in Dynasty. You can check us out now on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Facebook. Or you can watch the show on YouTube at youtube.com backslash NFL Max for your weekly Max fix. We are back. NFL Max is back. And what a week it was. Game of Thrones finally makes its return. The NFL draft is a week away. And the NFL is releasing the schedule for the 2019 season Wednesday night, 9 o'clock. And we had a few contract signings over the past week or so. So... As always, Ewok Juggernaut here with the hot pineapples. Nick, what is going on, man? You know, I've never watched a minute of Game of Thrones. Not even a minute. Oh, seriously? Yeah, not even a minute. I I don't know why. I'm not like a uh, like into like fantasy stuff, like Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. Like I can never get into that stuff. So I just never never bothered with Game of Thrones. Pineapple hearts are breaking over the airwaves right now. This is incredible. That, I could, I just couldn't, I can't get into it. Lord of the Rings is the gr- probably the greatest trilogy of all time. Wow, you need to watch that movie. Yeah, Forget I mean, it. I've seen it. I've seen a Harry Potter. I've well, seen a Lord of the Rings. Harry Potter's terrible, but I never watched like the whole the whole thing. My girlfriend. People love me. Harry. Don't people like Harry Potter more than? I would hope not. Lord of the Rings? No. Um, my I girlfriend is probably turning this podcast off as we're saying this, but uh, you cannot compare Harry Potter to Lord of the Rings. <laughs> what, one but, of my friend's uh, fiance, she's like a huge Harry Potter fan. So I'm sure he'll tell her when this hits too. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, she'll probably hate me too. <laughs> but anyways... Yeah, man. I mean, I'm excited about the NFL schedules coming out Wednesday night. Um, looking forward to seeing what kind of matchups. Hopefully we get some good quarterback matchups. I'm dying to see the Ravens versus the Browns and Baker versus Lamar Jackson. Off the top of your head, any any key matchups you're looking for? Yeah, anything that shows up on Thursday night football. <sighs> Yeah, I hate Thursday night football. Gosh, kidding. Yeah, it's an all it's an awful product. I it, it'll be interesting though. They did step up the schedule that was on a Thursday night last year. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. But off the top of my head, I mean, I just always get ramped up for the Cowboys Eagles games. Um, I mean, there's nothing really that sticks out to me. I just take the schedule for what it's worth when they come out and you know, just get to see who the Cowboys get to beat up on this year. Oh yeah, they'll be beating on up. A lot of teams this year. I think they're going to be good to go this year, honestly. But um, we'll see. You know, the news for the week uh, today, actually, uh, as of um, Tuesday night, we're, we're recording. Demarius Thomas signed with the New England Patriots, and he signed a one-year deal. Roto World is reporting up to $6 million with up to, in quotations, I'm sure it's incentive-based. But uh, Demarius Thomas landing in a juicy situation. I know we knocked him last year, uh, showing signs of decline. But um, you've got to assume if he makes the 53-man roster, I mean, I'm assuming he will because they have nobody, especially if you know Josh Gordon's banished from the NFL again. But Demarius Thomas with uh, Julian Edelman and a Gronkless Patriots, um, Thoughts uh, on Demarius Thomas here with Tom Brady? Yeah, he's done. I'm, I'm, this is, I mean, this is on par with signing, you know, Safari and Jenkins. I mean, both of them are just physically they seem done, and uh, I wouldn't expect too much out of them. I 
I'm I'm interested to see what the the structure of the contract is because I would have a hard time thinking. I don't know. I guess maybe he makes the 53, but why why waste the? I don't know. I'd rather see Maurice Harris, you know, fill out that spot, and I feel like he could be more productive than Demarius Thomas. Like I, Thomas is done for me, especially with an Achilles. I mean, that's a really hard road of recovery, and, and he looked physically done Achilles. before it. Yeah, he looked done before that. So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not looking too much into this. You can buy it. People are going to get stoked for redraft. Awesome, you know, someone out there is going to take him in like the seventh round of redraft and they're going to regret it majorly. But for dynasty purposes, doesn't move the needle, not one bit. In fact, if you have a share for some odd reason at this point, you may as well get rid of it. That's what I did. Yeah. The first sign, the first sign of ASJ signing with the Patriots, I sold him right away. So this is the window. Now, if you can cash out, I mean, for, for months now, he wasn't even signed on a team. So if you can cash out now with this news, Definitely move on. Um, he, I mean, he's 31 years old, Demarius Thomas. So, but you know, ASJ, there's still hope for ASJ. He's, he's still in his late 20s, mid to late 20s. No, nah, he looks physically done too. I, I feel yes. like he's going to go to New England and be the next Dwayne Allen. I feel like he's, they actually, if you look at the contract um, that he signed, they paid Matt Lacoste more. Really? From Denver. Yep. They paid Matt Lacoste more um, in salary annually than they paid. ASJ. So that tells you what they think of him. It's like he's literally in dynasty right now, carrying himself based on name value and what could have been because he, I mean, he hasn't done it anywhere he's gone. And not only has he not done it anywhere he's gone. And then I don't know, he goes to the Patriots because it's such a prime opportunity with Gronk out, but they already gave Lacoste more money. I just, they like Jacob Hollister. I just don't think it's going to be what people think it's going to be. I sold him for 302 and I was really happy about that. Yeah, I'd cash out 302 as well. Yeah. But um and you know, with the draft a week away, I'm sure they're going to take a tight end probably on day 2 or day 3. Um they're not going to get Hawkinson or, or Fant. There's no way. But um I mean they already have three on the roster too. I mean with Jacob Hollister who's been hanging around and Lacoste, like I I actually really like Lacoste, so ASJ's three on that depth chart for me. Yeah, it's a shame. As a prospect, he was one of my favorite tight end prospects, but as as it goes. Um, next, uh, Russell Wilson. I know we talked about him last week. There was rumors the past uh, week and a half, I would say, about uh, him getting traded to multiple teams. And um, they finally, in the 11th hour, actually it would technically be the 12th hour because his deadline was yesterday. And uh, Seattle finally signed him this morning. And they gave him a four-year contract, um, $140 million, $107 million guaranteed. And uh, Russell Wilson is the highest paid player in the NFL right now. So, Hey, Seattle, we got a deal. <laughs> Go Hawks. Go Hawks. But I'm going to see y'all in the morning. Good night. Time for y'all to go to bed. Finally, we can go to sleep. (laughs) (laughs) See y'all in the morning. My thoughts on this one is uh, kudos to Seattle for finally pulling the trigger here. They should have did this a long time ago. But they did it. They wrapped him up, face of the franchise, one of the best quarterbacks in football still. So it's good for Seattle, obviously. But for Russell Wilson, (laughs) I mean, and for fantasy, for Russell Wilson owners, uh, I would have loved to see him go to another team. I mean, Seattle, what are they doing? They're wasting Russell Wilson, one of the greatest quarterbacks we've seen in recent years, in his prime years, and they're just wasting his talent because they're not surrounding him by anybody. I mean, take a look at this wide receiver depth chart. Doug Baldwin, who's still not on pace to be healthy by uh, training camp. He's questionable for the start of training camp as of today. Tyler Lockett, he's not a number one even though I love him. Uh, Jerron Brown, David Moore, I mean, Amara Darbo. I mean, who are these guys? I mean, you got to be kidding me. So, I mean, you would assume that in a week from tomorrow, they're going to draft a wide receiver early, first or second round. But I think it's a missed opportunity. Um, If you're a Russell Wilson owner, it's, you know, it kind of sucks that he's staying with Seattle. Seattle has done him dirty. 
the past few years. Thoughts on uh, on this contract? No, I agree. Um, I mean, you know what? Good for Russ. We talked about Seattle last week. You know, they should have done this a while ago. They dropped the ball, um, but they made up for it and they paid him. And they're gonna put some clause in there that escalates with the salary cap rising. And I mean, good for Russ. The construct of the deal was great. He probably could have made more had he tested the market. Um, but he wanted to stay in Seattle. He's the type of guy that strikes me as like a one team for his career and done, or, I mean, you're literally going to have to kick him out of the door kind of guy. And I know he made, you know, that hard deadline, but he seemed like he never really wanted to leave Seattle. Uh, but with that being said, from a dynasty standpoint, I agree. Um, it's rough there in Seattle right now. I mean, they, they are wasting his prime years. They're rebuilding, but they're just constantly building on the defense. And they had so many playmakers on the defense and they let them walk and, I don't know what they're doing if they think they can just continue to replenish people on rookie contracts, but then they're not adding anything on offense. I mean, they spent a first round pick on Penny last year, but then he didn't even end up being their starter. Um, so it's just a very odd, odd thing that they're doing. And like you said, you want to assume that they're going to take wide receiver. Um, I would like to think that they would try to get a playmaker for us, but I'm not guaranteeing anything for them day one as far as a wide receiver goes i think um day two is more likely and uh you know it really is just a shame because russell wilson's such a good quarterback he really is you know dream scenario i would love to see hakeem butler go to seattle and you know russell wilson have a big dog to throw to and from everything i've seen as these mocks start to wrap up butler is likely to go in the second round so yeah i mean there's a shot you never know We'll see. We're a week away. Um, also, Adam Thielen signed a four-year contract extension with the Minnesota Vikings, sixty-four million dollars, and he was playing on a two point eight million dollar salary last year when he put up his uh, eight straight hundred-yard games in twenty eighteen. Thoughts on this Minnesota wide receiving core? Because I'm still in love with Stephon Diggs, and I still think he's the better wide receiver of the two. So they gave Thielen the big money, and I'm assuming they're going to have to do something next year. Um, or th- actually, wasn't there? There were rumors a month ago that uh, Stefan Diggs posted on Instagram or Twitter. I don't know which one it was. Uh, a JPEG. I think his brother made it. Uh, photoshopped him in a Redskins uniform. Did you hear about this? I did. Yeah. So I, f- I found that to be very interesting. Thoughts on you know Thielen and Diggs here? Yeah, it's very interesting. Um I mean, what a historical outlier Thielen is, Um, but kudos to him. I mean, coming from the undrafted ranks and making a name for himself, it's mighty impressive. He's just such an outlier. Um, You know, I just, you can't take that as the norm. Um, Thielen does not happen every day. And I think a lot of people, when you get to the fourth round of your rookie drafts, are looking for like that next hit from the outside and just caution yourselves because it doesn't happen often. I mean, he is... This is what he's done from his draft position has not been replicated before. I mean, he is such an outlier, Um, but kudos to him getting the big deal. He deserves it. He's played well and he's been consistent over the past three years. Um, But as far as the wide receiving corps goes, um, I agree. I think he's definitely the more talented wide receiver. Um, I think it's going to be interesting with Kirk Cousins in year two. They got a new offensive coordinator that we saw kick in at the end of the last year. Um, and the passing game actually went down, um, but so did Thielen's production. So it's going to be interesting to see where they funnel the ball this year. I have a funny feeling Thielen isn't going to be able to produce the same um, numbers that he has the past two years, um, but I also said that in the offseason last year that he was my bust um, in our bust and trust segment, and I look like an idiot for that now. So, Well, speaking of looking like an idiot, so, I, I, I look like an idiot right now. The one there. I totally screwed up. He did have a 1,000 yards last year. All oh, I was going to say, I can't believe that. Yeah, I'm you know I'm taking the idiot uh, hashtag right now. He had Okay, good. No problem, idiot. Yeah, he had 102 receptions for 1,000 yards and nine touchdowns. He only missed one game against Detroit in week nine. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and I remember last year in the beginning of the season, we were wondering if they can, you know, live with each other, both these wide receivers. But uh, 
it looks like is going to be boom or bust with Diggs as long as Thielen's there and Thielen's there. He's not going anywhere. So we'll see how yeah. that works. And I, I love Kirk. Honestly, I love Kirk Cousins as a quarterback. I feel like he's like a true point guard. He's he can handle and carry multiple wide or multiple receivers. I had just thought that it would be Diggs and more Rudolph based on his career using, you know, Jordan Reed and whatnot. Um, but it wasn't, it was definitely Thielen and then Diggs. That was the packing order last year for, for cousins and Kyle Rudolph was the one on the outside. So going into this year, it'll be interesting. I don't think either of them are going to have a problem sustaining value. I just don't think that for where Thielen is going right now in startups, that that would be the direction that I would be going. Moving on here, Ronald Jones, Rojo making the news here, impressing the coaching staff <laughs> in April. Uh, is this a April Fool's joke? Like three weeks too late? I don't know, but uh, you know, I just wanted to throw this in there because uh, you know we all know how much the NFL Max loves Ronald Jones. But I mean, you've got to assume Tampa Bay is going to draft a running back in this draft to compete with Ronald Jones. I know they used the second round pick on him just a year ago, but 77 yards on 30 touches. And we didn't really see anything uh, out of Ronald Jones. So what do you think? Do you think they're going to dress it like day one, day two? Or are they going to look to get like a discount in like, you know, in the later rounds? Um, it's, it's hard to say. I, they brought back Peyton Barber. I still really like Peyton Barber. Um, I think they liked him. I'm, I'm not buying this whole Rojo news in April. Um, I think this is just to boost his confidence. We all know Aaron's likes a back that can catch him. We all know that Rojo can't. So I'm not really buying it. Um, I think they'll like Peyton Barber in the role that he can give them, which is two down as an interior runner. But we all know Aaron's the new head coach there. Um, he really likes his pass catching back. And we also know that Rojo can't catch. Um, but the good news is this class, as, as weak as it is at running back overall, has you know a lot of options there who could provide that pass catching um, kind of, you know, specialty or expertise, so to, so to speak, and can plug in as in into that role. And you can run a committee using Peyton Barber and one of those backs or Rojo and one of those backs. Eventually, Rojo is going to get a shot. Um, but then again, it's a new coaching staff. You know, they don't have any allegiance to him as a second round pick. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Rojo. I'm not a buyer still at this point. Um, I did see a move for a fourth that I would pay. Um, but that's about it um, for Rojo. I'm not buying the smoke here in April, um, but the Bucks are definitely a situation to watch and target. Um, see what they do in the draft. I suspect that they'll go late day two, early day three to get a pass catching centric back. Um, someone like a Daryl Henderson, man, if they could snag him in the third, would be perfect there. Um, I'm all over that. Oh that, man, that, that would be happens, a great fit. He's going in the first round in your rookie drafts if that happens. Yeah, I think because- he's probably going there. Or- regardless in the back end probably like 12 he's going the one two term regardless in your rookie drafts but you're absolutely right if he ends up in oakland if he ends up in philly or he ends up in tampa one of these prime spots yeah you'll see him shoot up the rookie board yeah and people who were drafting rojo last year were were chasing that scenario situation because of tampa bay i mean nobody was chasing rojo for rojo let's be realistic here people were chasing rojo because he was in tampa bay so, yeah, I mean, just got to be careful when you're chasing situations over players. But when you throw a name like Daryl Henderson in there, man. Wheels up. Wheels up. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break, and we will be right back. All right. We are back, and we're going to dive into some rookie tight ends and some quarterbacks. Two positions we didn't cover over the past few podcasts, but – uh Going to tight ends, starting off with tight ends here. Um, me and Nick are going to talk about our tiers and who we got in there. Obviously, you know, you hear a lot of uh, comparison, in my opinion, wrongfully so, about the 2017 tight end class. I've heard a few podcasts say that this tight end class in 2019 is going to rival the 2017 class. And I completely disagree with that. Not sure why anybody thinks that. Aside from the top two players uh, who we all know, 
Uh, there's really nobody that I have crazy super interest of, of, but, um, nonetheless, we'll go through them anyway. So for me, obviously tier one, I've got Noah Fant and TJ Hawkinson, and I'm going to go with Noah Fant as my one, obviously with the upside, the, uh, metrics that Noah Fant put up is absolutely ridiculous. One of the best prospects here, uh, over the past 10 years easily. Um, he's rivaling guys like OJ Howard, Ingram and Njoku, you know, metrically, uh, you would say, uh, he looks like Mike Kosecki, but with the production. <laughs> so when you can get a freak athlete, like no offense, and, um, obviously they were, uh, cannibalizing each other at Iowa, but if either of these guys were on a, a team with themselves, I'm sure the stats would be through the roof, but no offense is, you know, the upside is just ridiculous. So you got to go him number one. And uh, for me, TJ Hawkins, it would be number two. So what do you got, Nick? Yeah. And I think this is pretty consensus across, you know, the industry, so to speak. Um, I think everyone has Fanton Hawkinson at the top. Uh, it's just a matter of, do you have them in the same tier um, or not? And for your instance, you do. Um, I think a lot of people do. I think a lot of people even have Hawkinson above Fant at this point. Um, but for me, I'm still going Fant, and he is in a tier by himself with Hawkinson in a tier by himself in tier two. Um, I think these two are head and heels above any other tight end in this class. It's very top heavy, in my opinion. Um, Noah Fant, though, man, what can you say about this kid? You were just speaking to his athleticism. He is, I mean, a freak. And, um, I think one, one thing that I would love to see for him, you know, is development on the blocking side, because he doesn't have that skill like Hawkinson does. Hawkinson is a very, very good blocker and blocking the ability to block leads to playing time. And so I think that's the one thing, um, in the comparison of the two where, you know, you have to weigh as, as a dynasty owner, you know, do I want someone who's not going to come off the field? Because that's going to be Hawkinson. Hawkinson can do it all. He can block. He can catch. You know, I don't want to take that away from Hawkinson. He can catch, but he's not Noah Fant. He doesn't have the athleticism, athleticism of a Noah Fant, and he is not as as much of a pure catcher and, and able to bust up the seam like Noah Fant can. But with that being said, he's still a very good pass catcher, and his blocking is mature enough right now to play every down in the NFL. And that's not something that you can really say for Noah Fant. You're going to have to get creative with Fant. He's going to be an Evan Ingram type, Evan Ingram type, where you know he's more of a receiver than he is, you know, a tight end at this point. But he just is going to be that guy that you can create mismatches with. I think that's why a lot of people like mocking him to Green Bay. Imagine him with Aaron Rodgers, where you know he has the ability to create. You can move him around. You can move, use him as a chess piece, similar to a Randall Cobb type. Randall Cobb didn't light the world on fire with his athleticism, but he was a chess piece. He could create mismatches. Fant's going to be the same type of guy. You can put him, you know, in in different slots in the rotation, in the formation, and he's going to be successful as a pass catcher but you can't rely on him to be on the field every snap. So as a dynasty owner, you have to decide, do you want the upside that comes with the pass catcher or do you want the guaranteed playing time because snaps yield production? And that's what you're going to have to decide. And that's why a lot of people I think have at this point put Hawkinson over fan and I'll, most people, I would say 90% of people have them in, in a tier together. For me, I like to bake upside in my decisions. So Fant sits a, in a tier by himself. He's the clear choice for me. Um, but I'm definitely not, you know, a Hawkinson hater by any stretch of the imagination. I just really like what Fant brings to the table because, I mean, I think it, it's pretty well documented. I also have a love affair with Evan Ingram. So I just like those types of, of upside tight ends in, in a position that is bereft of any type of talent whatsoever. I think those are, those are the type of tight ends that you need to elevate you and really make a difference at the position. Yeah, just to really finish up here on Noah Fant, he compares to one of my all-time favorite tight end prospects. And almost number to number when you're looking at him across the board, and that's Vernon Davis. Now, Davis was the ultimate tragedy going to San Francisco and being 
uh, incredibly underutilized by that coaching staff and wasted his prime years. But when you look at the comparison between Noah Fant and Vernon Davis, I mean, they go toe to toe, uh, six, four, six, three, both two fifty. Their catch radius is top five percentile, 1046 to 1049 yards per reception in college, 15 versus 17, uh, four, five in a 40 yard dash. And we all know Vernon Davis ran a four, three, eight, but, uh, the height adjusted speed score is top five percentile. And uh, here's where Noah Fant beats him in his agility scores. His three cones, 6.81, and his 20-yard, 4.22. Three cone, top five percentile. Vertical, top five percentile. His burst, his agility, his 40, his radius, and his three uh, height-adjusted speed score. All top five percentile. So, you know, we have a second chance here. Because when Vernon Davis came out, You know, we were all, you know, drooling at the possibilities and it just never panned out for for Vernon Davis. Uh, He should have been like an elite top three tight end, uh, you know, when he was in his prime. But uh, they didn't use him, unfortunately. But uh, we have a second chance here with Noah Fant. And um, we're just, you know, I'm hoping here he goes to the right spot where they're going to make him um, somewhat of a focal point in the passing game. So just wanted to throw that out there. Moving on, tier two, I've got Irv Smith Jr. from Alabama. And um, I'm not in love with any of these tight ends here. i got a couple of crushes here, some sleepers. But I'm going to go with Irv Smith Jr. as my number three tight end. I'm pretty sure that's consensus. But there's a couple guys underneath that that uh, I really want to talk about. But who's your number three? Uh, Irv Smith is not my number three, uh, but he is in that tier, same tier with, with my number three. I mean, if you're going to rank them, um, but my third tier consists of two guys, um, Irv Smith being one. Uh, but the guy that I have slightly above him is, uh, Jace Sternberger. Mm. Yep. I really like Jace. He is the consensus three from what I'm seeing in ADP. Who Irv? Uh, no, uh, Jace Sternberger. Oh, Really? Yeah, interesting. I didn't know I, that. I believe DLF. Had I haven't looked three. at rookie DL or uh, rookie ADP yet from DLF. I'm I'm still letting it compile because a lot of that take that ADP for what it's worth. A lot of that too is like them running mock drafts, and you know it's a lot different what people do in those mock drafts than when they're on the clock. Like they're just you know that they're from A and M, so they take you know Sternberg, you know. So it's right, just. Yeah. Yeah, they can just be goofy with those with those um, some of those mock drafts. Wait until about a week after the NFL draft, and you're going to start seeing some real data points roll in. Um, but I did not know Sternberger was viewed that highly by the community as a whole. It's good. Yeah, Sternberger and Irv Smith both up there, um, three and four. But uh, a couple guys here I want to talk about in my next tier, and two uh, two crushes here, two sleepers, Josh Oliver from San Jose state and Foster Moreau from LSU. And both of these guys are absolute freaks. Uh, Foster Moreau specifically six, four, two fifty, and runs a four, six. So got some awesome height adjusted speed, 4.11 in a 20 yard. And that's top five percentile. And every other metric is in green and checks all the boxes. The problem with him is, uh, lack of production in college at LSU and his yards per reception was only 12 yards uh, per reception. So he's got the height, he's got the speed, he's got the weight. And um, Josh Oliver, another guy who uh, I'm a pretty big fan of, he's got those big hands, 10 and three quarter hands. And he, you know, he's got the speed and also the burst. So Josh Oliver, Foster Moreau. I know a lot of people are talking about Dawson Knox, but for me, it's an incomplete profile because of, you know, obviously we know they didn't use him at Old Miss, but those are three guys there that are in the same tier for me. Interesting. Um, I like I like the uh, Oliver call. Um, not on my not in my fourth tier, um, but he's in that fifth tier. Um, Foster Moreau, I'm out. I'm out on Foster Moreau. Just not a fan um, wow. of this game. Just someone I watch. I watch a lot of LSU football um, before I was moved to South Carolina. Became a Clemson fan because just. You, you really have to when you're here. Um, I was an LSU fan for a long, long time. So I still watch a lot of LSU football, just not a Foster Moreau fan. 
I just don't think he's explosive. I don't think he has the the burst. I don't think he's twitchy enough to be successful at the next level. I just think he's going to be a jag. Like he'll just be a guy who settles in as a number two on a depth chart, and he'll just kind of go by the wayside over time. Um, just don't see it with Foster Moreau. Um, but as far as the other two guys that I'm considering, I really cut my list down to six with seven with Oliver being that seventh potential. Maybe let's talk about it. Um, but the guys for me in tier four um, and my five and six are Warring and K- Caleb Wilson. Um, both of these guys, I think, are going to be pedigreed. I think both of these guys have a strong case to go day two. And if they go day two, I think that there's, you know, definitely piques my interest. I think for me to consider both of these guys, they'll have to go day two or very early day three. Um, I think Caleb Wilson has a better shot to go day two, but I'm more intrigued by warring. Um, and if he did goes day two, he's definitely going to be a guy that I'm going to be targeting um, on the lower end of the spectrum as far as notoriety and, you know, what people are thinking of him. We'll see what happens after the draft because, you know, the, you know, the community as a whole will start boosting people based on draft pedigree. Um, but I think in this case of tight ends, um, this far down down the list, I think you have to be pedigreed. And if they, they go mid-day three, then they're off my board. I'm not even going to consider them because at a position that I consider, you know, outside of a tight end premium format or start two tight end mandatory, I just... I just don't value the tight end position as a whole. And so I make my list very small. And if I don't get my guys last year, you know, it was Mark Andrews and it was Dallas Goddard. Like those are the guys that I really wanted. Um, Hayden Hurst, I had some interest in. Mike Kosicki, I had zero interest in. So I just like to make my list very small. I think if you're going to grab a tight end, a lot of times they take three years to develop. I don't want to clog the back end of my roster with long shot tight ends. It's just not my style. So I like to really, you know, narrow my list down and Warring and Wilson, they'll be on the list if they can get pedigreed in day two. If not, they're off and I'll stick to the top four, which will be Fant, Hawkinson, Sternberger, and Smith. Yeah, I agree. In a one tight a non tight end premium league, um I'm really not looking to roster any of these tight ends aside from like the top two or three. So uh, tiny and premium is a whole different ball game. Uh, I would definitely be looking to roster a couple of the guys like Oliver and Moreau Knox. I don't know. I mean, like, well, really there's only five tight ends here that had respectable college production. And that's Caleb Wilson, Sternberger and Fant and Hawkinson. Um, you can throw in maybe Oliver. And that's about it. The rest of them, the college production wasn't there. Um, Dawson Knox, we all know why. Yeah. The guy never scored a tight end in, in his whole collegiate career. So Yeah. Uh, his his profile is so incomplete from a production standpoint. He's a strong athlete. I just, yeah. I just don't trust it. I just don't trust it at a position where it already has so much development to go into it. And, you know, more specifically with Dawson Knox and lack of college production, I know the thought is because he went to Ole Miss and you had Metcalf and uh, A.J. Brown there. But it's not like Metcalf and A.J. Brown were lighting the world on fire. I mean, Metcalf missed half the season. Exactly. Metcalf so, wasn't even on the field for the most right. part. So when, when you know, you're watching games when Metcalf's not even in the game, I mean, they didn't throw to, to, to Dawson Knox. So it's, it's very concerning. It's a red flag. But I know the community is relatively high on Dawson Knox, I guess, just because of the athletic profile. But you know, he's not going to get drafted early anyway. So, you know, we'll see. But I mean, that that's pretty much it. I mean, I don't really want to touch on guys like at least Mac from Notre Dame, uh, Tom Sweeney. I know Waldman's pretty high on Trevion Wesco, but uh, the rest of these guys, you know, they're late. You know, they might even not, might not even get drafted. So we can move on here to quarterback. And obviously, uh, the number one quarterback. In his own tier for me and most people would be Kyler Murray from Oklahoma. So I'm assuming, uh, you know, Kyler's your number one, right? Yeah. Um, he's, he's definitely my number one. I think there's less of a gap than, than people perceive. Um, he's still in the tier by himself for me. Uh, but I mean, Haskins, I really like Haskins. The more I watch Haskins, the more I like Haskins. He dominates the, the middle part of the field. I mean, he, has such a cannon for an arm. He's he's accurate. You don't have to worry about the accuracy. It's not a question with him. And 
you know, I was just listening to a podcast today, actually, um, with Kyle Krabs over at um, the Draft Network. They do a great podcast, him and Joe Marino. They do great. First off, they do great work over there. Um, I've been following Kyle Krabs and Joe Marino since Kyle owned his own little small entity called um, NDT Scouting. And he brought Joe aboard and they brought a couple other guys and they used to do a paid, um, you know, player profile kind of draft guide. I mean, everyone nowadays does a draft guide. His is extremely detailed. Now they they formed a new, you know, a new entity called the Draft Network, which is a, it has investors. It's an actual product. It's not just his own small little thing. So he built out the draft guide and he offers it for free this year. Yeah. So Kyle does great work. I mean, he does offensive and defensive side of the ball. He doesn't do it from a fantasy standpoint, um, but it still is great, fantastic insight into, you know, potential players that that will hit your fantasy team he does it from just a strict film standpoint um you know he looks at production and and that kind of stuff but he's not doing it for fantasy purposes his is purely draft what he was talking about on that podcast was was murray and the height concerns and he was saying like yeah i mean you know it's not a huge issue to some teams if you have a coach who can scheme plays on the outside you can clearly see you know, Murray is more comfortable when he's hitting the boundaries and when he's focused on the peripherals of the field because, you know, yes, it's not that big of a deal. You can point to Russell Wilson, you know, you can throw around bodies, but he was saying there's no doubt about it that it affects his ability in the middle of the field because he has to work around those bodies. Whereas the bigger quarterbacks, they can see over the top of them. They don't have to do as much moving and manipulating. He might be able to do it, but it doesn't mean it's it's not affecting him. And you can see it, he was saying, you know, when you watch the film and he studies every single game of these guys that he can get his hands on. I mean, you can, he says you can definitely tell the comfort level on the outside of the field. And he can still hit the middle of the field. It's not that he can't do it because of his size, but it is, is definitely still affected by his size. So I thought just yeah. that was interesting to put it in perspective like that. Like, yeah, of course he can still do it and move around, guys, but it doesn't mean that he's not affected by it. Yeah. And it's not like Dwayne Haskins where he's Dinkin and Duncan. I mean, that's his game. Ironically, he's like the polar opposite of Kyler Murray. So, but just real quick on Murray, I know he's listed at 207, but there's no way that was his plan no. weight last year. Nope. And like, I know I talked about a few podcasts ago, if you were ever going to um, manufacture combine, that DK Metcalf would be, you know, the poster boy. And for quarterbacks, it's Kyler Murray for me. I mean, they have him listed at 5'10", 207. I'm sorry. I'm not buying it. He doesn't look 5'10 when you watch the film. You know, you watch Russell Wilson's tape at Wisconsin. He looks 5'10". He looks 200 plus. But you watch Kyler Murray run around there. I don't think he's 5'10", 207. And the NFL uh, on Sirius Radio, NFL uh, 88, they were actually talking about how you can manipulate your combine numbers, your height, and your fingers, uh, your hand size rather. Mm -hmm. And there's ways that they do it. And I, first time I was hearing it this year that they massage your hand, uh, to a degree where you can actually gain like a half an inch or so, and they can stretch you out with your spine and you can gain another inch in your height. So five ten two Oh seven. I just, I'm not buying it. I think he's really like five, nine, you know, sub 200. And I mean, can he gain the weight? Of course. But is he going to run like as fast as he's been running? Um, just something, you know, yeah. just some food for thought, you know? No, I agree. Definitely 207 was not his playing weight. And we talk about this point with running backs is like, you know, if they're 185, like, and you want them to bulk up, like, it's never a good thing to hear in the offseason that a running back has been hitting the weight room in order to bulk up to prepare for more carries. Because with the increased weight comes a decreased explosive. It, like a, a decreased explosion. Whereas you want the big back who's 230 and is shedding weight mm -hmm. to get ready for the season because 230 down to 215, he's still prototypical, but he gains that explosiveness. So Kyler Murray, I mean, he isn't just a, I, I don't want to put him in a box and say he's a pure runner um, because he's not. He's got arm talent. He's, he's a fantastic quarterback. He really is. I think he can be something special. I, think everyone wants him to be Pat Mahomes and he's not. 
Um, yeah. But at the same time, like 207, he's not going to be playing at that. He is going to be a small dude. He's going to have to learn to use that explosiveness and not lose it. But at the same time, he can't afford to take hits. He's going to have to learn how to get down and not, and not absorb some of that punishment because he is going to have a hard time, hard time staying. If you think Lamar Miller or Lamar <laughs> Jackson looks small, forget about it. Kyler Murray is going to look like, I mean, a little kid underneath a pile of, you know, nose mm-hmm. tackles. I mean, you remember watching Johnny Menzel getting rocked on Sundays. I mean, he got rocked every week. And uh, I'm a big fan of Lamar Jackson. Every time he, you know, tucks the ball and runs, you I'm, on the edge, I'm on the edge of my seat. Yeah, you cringe. I, I've got him in almost every fantasy league. And uh, this guy, he's, you know, he's, he's going to get hurt and it sucks, but it is what it is. But yeah. We'll see. I'm hoping that Murray's not the next Johnny Manziel, that's for sure, because I'm, I'm a big fan of his. But moving on, uh, my number three quarterback, uh, the man crush is on with Will Greer. I don't know if it's the beard or what, but Will Greer is a beast, West Virginia. Um, he's got he's got it all for me. He's got the velocity. I mean, even the age. I know he's 24, and that's relatively old for uh, for a rookie, but a lot of experience with the couple schools that he played with in college. So I like the experience. Um, I like what he brings to the table. He's a winner. And I think someone's going to get a steal because, uh, well, let's, let's throw this number out there. Let's go 3.5. You're going to take the under the over on quarterbacks drafted in the first round with 3.5. I'm going over. I'm going four. You're going to go four? Yeah. So you figure Kyler Murray, 101, uh, Dwayne Haskins is not getting past the Giants or even that spot if someone trades up ahead of him. And I'm thinking Will Greer, someone's going to trade up like uh, we saw the Ravens do last year in the late first round. And take See, Will I don't Greer. think it'll be Greer. You don't think it'll be Greer? No, nah, I think be? I think someone's going to come get Locke. Which is fine. I, I'm not a I'm not a Drew Locke fan, but I mean I get it, I guess. Um, but then I think someone's gonna make the real bad mistake and take Daniel Jones in the first round. I just do not Duke. like Daniel Jones at all. Um Me neither. I got him out of my top five. Yeah. But I mean he'll get he'll get I think he'll get pushed up into the first round. I don't know. I don't know what he what he's missing that makes NFL teams not interested in him. Because I'm with you. He's my my number three quarterback. I love him. I think he's a playmaker. I'm super excited about his prospects in the NFL. But it's going to be dra- draft pedigree with him. You know. I mean, again, a similar thing to tight end. Like you just can't value this position too highly in a start one. Super flex, different discussion. All these guys are on the board. But when you're talking, you know, one QB for me, it's it's really Murray Haskins. And then maybe Drew Locke, depending on if he goes in the top 15. But, I mean, outside yeah. of those guys, I can't imagine anyone else in the start one even considering them, and Will Greer included, um, unless he ends up you know, in the top half of the second round. Then I would consider him because I really like and believe in the talent. It's just all draft pedigree. I don't see him going in the first, but if he slips past that midway in the second, I don't see how you can consider him in a start one either. Yeah, even in Superflex, aside from Murray, Haskins, and Greer, I don't want any of these guys. Um, I would love to take a flyer on Tyree Jackson in the late rounds just because of his athletic profile but and because of his size too. But aside from those guys, I really have no interest in this quarterback class. What if uh, Greer went somewhere like Pittsburgh? Uh, but they already they got their guy um, that they're grooming behind Roethlisberger. Who, Rudolph? Yeah. Yeah. They took him in the second round, no? Eh. Yeah. Still, no, yeah. I'm not oh, saying they I'm didn't. Third, third round. Third, right? Yeah, but I'm not saying they didn't, but I don't know. I'm not buying it. Mm. Yeah. I think Greer would be a really fun quarterback there in, in Pittsburgh. I mean, anywhere Greer goes, I'm a buyer. I just I want him on my team. Even in one yeah. QB, I want him. So We'll see. And that, you know, those are my guys. Uh, Murray I like Haskins Stidham career. too, as, as a developmental, I think he's got a really nice throwing motion just from someone who like, you know, was always playing baseball and coaches baseball and is always dealing with, he just has a beautiful throwing motion. Mm-hmm. So 
as a developmental guy, interested to see where he goes. I'd love for him to go to the Cowboys as a backup. I would think that would be a great spot for him. You just want everyone to go to the Cowboys because you want to get rid of Dak Prescott. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. Don't tell anybody. But uh, that'll be it for the quarterbacks. And uh, we're just going to take a quick bit break right now as I'm stuttering. And we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. And that'll be it for the show for this week, for this episode. And we'll be back next week for a special live stream episode uh, Thursday night, April 25th at 8 o'clock p.m. A YouTube exclusive only. Uh, I'm not sure it'll make the uh, iTunes or any of the uh, podcast platforms, but youtube.com backslash NFL Max is the uh, link if you want to join us. And an open invitation to all subscribers. You can get on air and uh, we'll answer your questions and we'll get you on, on air for the show. And uh, join us. Join the party Thursday night, April 25th. 8 o'clock. We'll be on YouTube. That'll be it for this week. Just wanted to thank everybody out there for listening, for watching, and I uh, will see you guys next week for the NFL Draft 1-1. Everybody, one clap. Thanks, guys. Anytime Ronald Jones makes the show, you know, <laughs> during for a rough night. Sleep is at a premium nowadays, so. I can only imagine. Yeah. Oh, yes. Good job, Russ. As we're waiting for Nick, NFL Max is sponsored by the NFL Max Cola. Taking Cola to the max and you you could tell like do I freeze but like when you freeze do I freeze yes if anyone's getting a discount they're getting a discount on my work yeah oh check this picture out this is isn't that hysterical I can't, I can't see, see it. it oh there you go I'll have, to, I'll have to send it to you it's a really funny picture of him Sorry, it's like is a proud dad moment. Was he sticking his tongue out there? Yeah, it's hysterical. Hey, quick question. Yeah. In that graphic that you have sitting there, you see it? Mm-hmm. Well, why is the earth round? <laughs> <laughs> that is for another podcast, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> That is for another podcast. Man, you're going to have to go back and binge watch eight seasons. It's incredible. One of the greatest shows of all time. Making my presence felt. Someone uh, sent me a question for fantasy. No kidding. Can we do it on the show? Uh, it was fantasy baseball. Uh. <laughs> this is so rough. It sucks. I know, I'm in the middle of a thought. <laughs> oh. I never... The internet's in and out. We had a major problem with, like, there was an outage, like, two days ago. Okay, I'll say this. I don't believe anything NASA puts out there. Okay. So I, I've got a lot of stuff on NASA that I can go over with you one day, how they lie. Yeah, I don't everything. have enough time tonight. Yeah. Basically, NASA wants you to believe that we're a bunch of monkeys spinning on a ball, a water ball. Don't believe it. <laughs> that is hysterical. Would you custom order it? Hell yeah, I did. That's hysterical. Courtesy of my wonderful job. One clap. One clap! One clap! What you got?
Yeah, we might have to can it. Our TV is not working either, so it's definitely like an in mass internet problem. Oh, okay. All yeah. right, so um, just let me know what day, what night you're free, and we'll we'll figure it out. All right. Actually, the TV just came back on, so let's give it another shot. I'll okay. log back in. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye.